This week on Theater Talk. It was hard to do plays and raise a family, just the hours, you know. I mean, dinner time and homework time and theater mm -hmm. didn't quite work for me. So <laughs> I did other things, and um, but I really love doing theater. I really, really Did you always it. miss it, though, while you were away from it, while you were raising the children? I'm not a children. missing kind of person. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, fought at my bargains, called my friends, heated my enemies. What's his reason? From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. There is, uh, Susan, a fine new revival of The Merchant of Venice on Broadway right now, starring Al Pacino. Now, we couldn't get out, so we got somebody <laughs> even better. <laughs> James Shapiro, my old professor at Columbia University, is the great Shakespeare scholar today. He has written several books on Shakespeare, 1599, A Year in Shakespeare's Life, Contested Will, a fascinating book about those people who don't believe Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare, and a book called Shakespeare and the Jews, which brings him here to talk about Shylock, I think one of the most difficult villains to get one's mind around in the whole Shakespeare canon. And probably to act as well. Absolutely. Jim, welcome back to Theater Thank Talk. you. It's great. Last time I was here, I was saying I had just seen this performance, Al Pacino in the Park, and in previews, and I was sure that it was going to go to Broadway, and you said, well, we'll bring you back if it goes to Broadway. <laughs> so, you back. Uh, I'm glad it went to Broadway. <laughs> uh, now, I've, I'm fascinated by Shylock because uh, the way Shylock has been played and interpreted over the years is kind of a history of anti-Semitism, really. Shylock, as Shakespeare conceived him, was a villain and an anti-Semitic villain, correct? We don't know what Shakespeare's thinking was or whether he was trying to play against or to the prejudices of his audience. It's really hard to tell. Mm -hmm. The play sits on a razor's edge. Some actors especially after the 18th century, tapped into the sympathetic sides of him. Mm -hmm. Others played into the demonic side. This guy's a killer. He's out for blood. So the play's been done both ways. And the real problem is, how do you do this play after the Holocaust? Yeah. And uh, directors and, and actors playing Shylock are really thrown by that. So there are a lot of great Hamlets out there, very, very few great Shylocks. Mm. It, just take us back, though. What, how would a, an Elizabethan, what would an Elizabethan thought of a Jew? thought of a Jew back then. When Marlowe writes The Jew of Malta, a year or two before Shakespeare writes The Merchant of Venice, it's clear his Jew has red beard, hooked nose, stereotypic guy who brags about poisoning Christians and doing all kinds of devilish things. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare is very deliberate not to indicate that Shylock looks any different than anyone else. Mm -hmm. In other words, when Portia comes in in the trial scene and says, which is the merchant and which is the Jew, it's not a laugh line. Mm -hmm. They both dress the same way, although to this day, a lot of Shakespeareans uh, still believe that uh, Shylock must have been that stereotypic Jew. So on the inside, he might have been demonic, but there's a lot to play with. Is he, is he thrust into this killer role because his daughter has betrayed him and the Christians have, have taken her away? It's, there's enough packed in. It's one of Shakespeare's first really great characters. He writes this 1597 or so three or four years, you know, before the great run of Hamlet, Othello, and others. So mm. it's it's one of the first great plays, and it's, it sits uncomfortably between tragedy and comedy. He cer certainly is perceived as an other, because almost every character in that play says, oh, the Jew, makes notice that that's he's right. a Jew, and that's something different. Right, and to really, you know, that's a great point, Susan, and to answer your question, in Act Four, if you look at the first uh, quarto edition of the play, Shakespeare, he's writing a terrific courtroom scene, mm -hmm. stops writing Shylock in the speech heading, and he starts writing Jew. Yeah. And you think, <laughs> whoa, even Shakespeare, as sympathetic as he is, sees this guy as the Jew, the other, everything which the white Christians are not mm -hmm. in this play. Mm -hmm. Why is Al Pacino, do you think, so successful in this role? He's very, very impressive, and I've seen him uh, first in the park where he's a small guy and he's energetic, but when you've moved him indoors, he, he, he's actually physically larger, it seems, so he fills the stage 
a little bit more. And I think he plays the the abused guy. He's guy. very sympathetic. In He's a way. very yeah. sympathetic. You know, the audience is packing the house. I, right. Coming in from the outside, I, I, I saw more people speaking with my Brooklyn accent or Jersey accent. I mean, this is not a Broadway crowd packing the house. Pacino brings into that house people who are not theater goers. And it's thrilling because they don't, they're brought in by Pacino and they're captivated by Shakespeare play. And it's, it's great watching that bit of theater in this house. But he is able to tap into the complexity of, uh, of Shylock, which is a man who is forced to convert, humiliated, who is just about to crush his, uh, his adversary, his rival. And the contained rage, you know, you see flashes of Serpico, you see flashes of all of his career uh, right up to this moment. It's, it's quite thrilling. When you say it's a sympathetic portrayal, is it possible after the Holocaust to play Shylock in a way he might have been played in Eliz Eliz Elizabethan times, excuse me, as the real villain? Go full on with the villainy and, oh, well, maybe he is kind of human, but he's a real bad guy who wants that pound of flesh. At a certain point I'm in the play, he is a real bad guy. He wants <laughs> that pound of flesh, and Pacino makes that's you right. sympathize with that, yes, and that's one of the yes, that's one of his gifts. Mm -hmm. And F. Murray Abraham, who's going to be coming back with the revival in March, is the same. And I'd say in this generation, they for me are the two best Shylocks because they make you identify with them when they are the most bloodthirsty. Mm -hmm. But th this play is like a canary in the coal mine of how much anti-Semitism is in the air, yeah. and uh, it's not as toxic as the play was when I was growing up. I, I asked the, the folks at the public, are they getting calls from Jewish groups or even individuals complaining? And they said, no, they're not doing that. So this is a kind of post-post-Holocaust moment. I, I, wanna, I wanna pick up something you said though. Um, you said the play is not toxic the way it was when you were growing up. Yeah. So what was it like then? I mean, was it tough to do a production of The Merchant of Venice back then because uh, Jews would be offended by seeing it staged? Why? Wouldn't, you know, Jewish groups, this shouldn't be done. You know, in, in Palestine, in Israel, before it became a state, intellectuals, theater people debated, should we allow this play ever to be done? Yeah. Is it too anti-Semitic? And they said, you know, we should do it. But then, in 88, Barry Kyle took the RSC to Israel, and they did it. But they left out the conversion of Shylock because that offended sensibilities. Oh, and then I saw it 15 years ago to the week uh, in, in Israel, uh, Hebrew production, and they had uh, Shylock transformed into, from a secular guy, into a right-wing, rabid, religious, angry Orthodox. man. Mm -hmm. And spraying everybody with a kind of imaginary machine gun in his rage, a kind of settler, you know, rage. And oh, a month or two later, after I saw this two blocks from the Camry Theater, Yitzhak Rabin was gunned down. By, so, a, more, a, by a guy just like that, just like absolutely. That. So mm -hmm. I always think of this play as a play that tells more about the moment we live in. Mm -hmm. And this production, I know we're talking about Shylock and uh, Lily, Lily, uh, Lily Rape is great in this. The, the takeaway for me from this production was smart women have to deal with the fact that they marry disappointing guys. <laughs> that's the final <laughs> image, and that's what, that's what this Shylock is about, and that's why it's going to play a long time on Broadway. And Sullivan's <laughs> really put that in there, too. Have, <laughs> absolutely. Have there been productions that have... Um, I think of uh, one in John Gross's fine book about Shylock. Yes. He, he's very tough on Jonathan Miller's famous production with Olivier, where he almost took the Jew out of Shylock yeah. and made the Christians the real heavies. And then, you know, Olivier is is not a villain, but almost a noble figure. Is that a misreading, an imbalance of it doing It may the play? have been the worst role Olivier ever played, you know, on film, certainly. I, I didn't get to see him do his great roles or mm. even his bad roles on stage. But his way of doing Shylock was kind of prosthetic Shylock. If you just add a little nose, you get to the part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think uh, American actors are really good at getting at the contained rage mm. of this character. And Pacino uh, and Mari Abraham as well, neither of whom are Jewish, but I'm sure half the audience thinks they are by the time the play is <laughs> over, uh, get at that rage. And I think, to be honest, I'm a native New Yorker, and I think New Yorkers carry around a lot of repressed rage, and we can identify with somebody when we catch them on the hip in that way. You say, oh, sorry. You say that it's like the canary in the mind, or I think of it as, as like a, a Rorschach test, and, and the uh, critics certainly interpret this play through their own lens time and time again, but is it possible to do an objective merchant, one that isn't interpreted politically? Impossible. Yeah. I'll tell you, one of the great Nazi movies never made 
they were going to take the, the group that made Yud Sus, that most, I mean, you watched that movie, I watched the movie, I'm an anti-Semite the second it's over. <laughs> and they wanted to get the cast right at the end of the war and use it to do a great Merchant of Venice mm. because it's a play that can be appropriated for whatever political ends you want. I wouldn't say that this production is overtly political, but it's inevitably political even if it's not an explicitly a uh, political play. Wasn't there a famous German actor, Ver Werner Krauss, I think, yes. who played a Shylock yes. that was put on by the Nazis in Vienna, and yeah. it was done as, this is what a Jew is like. It right. was an anti-Semitic Shylock. Absolutely, and there were 50 productions during the Nazi years in, in Nazi countries because the play could play to that. But there are, look, there are old Jews who grab me by the lapel and say, but Shakespeare wrote the lines, I am a Jew with not a Jew eyes. It's a sympathetic portrayal. Mm -hmm. Some days I wake up and think it is, and some days I wake up and I said, that can't be. Mm. So it's, it's a brilliantly constructed part. Mm -hmm. And actors love parts that allow you to go back and forth over that line and pull in the audience. In, in a larger play, which has a lot of wheels and moving parts to it. Mm. Um, of the Shylocks you've seen, I know, I know you've seen many who is the greatest? That's a hard question because I get older and I look for different things in the play. Uh, I'm fondest of Murray's. Uh, F. Murray Abraham. F. Murray Abraham plays a Shylock that scared the living daylights out of me. Mm. Um, uh, Pacino is going to be remembered as an extraordinary Shylock. I I've never seen a great, great Shylock in England. Really? I think they pull back from the Jew stuff. They pull back from just the the edginess and the rage. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure why. It's a it's a play that is done often, but not often done brilliantly. Over there in Israel, how was the uh, the Shylock you saw the, around the time of? It wasn't memorable. The comic actors were memorable. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of funny stuff in this play as well, and uh, the park version wasn't as funny as the indoor version. One thing I realized, you know, when Shakespeare built the Globe, we all think of Shakespeare at the Globe. Yeah. They built the Globe because they couldn't get an indoor theater up and running. And it took nine years before they finally got Blackfriars, an indoor theater up and running. Mm. And the actors and, uh, and Shakespeare must have been so happy to play indoors because you can do things indoors that you can't outdoors. Sullivan is, is Dan Sullivan is, the director is, is a brilliant product, uh, director in the park. It's, it's, it's like playing in Yankee Stadium and mounting a play there. It's almost impossible. The energy just disappears. It's too beautiful. Yeah. And I was nervous going into the Broadway theater thinking, can you move this packet indoors? And he managed to do so. And it's a more melancholy experience. And I, I, I feel that in the play. It's really a melancholy play. And they, they brought out that quality beautifully. And is this an American take on Shylock? I mean, in your book, you talk about Brazilian and British. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And even what I was talking about earlier about the, the woman disappointed with a man, it's it's not just an American take. It's it's a New York take and, on the world. And what is a New York <laughs> American take on Shylock? Uh, New York American take on Shylock is uh, you know you don't have to be Jewish to eat uh, uh, rye bread or whatever that commercial <laughs> uses say you're growing up. <laughs> that he's more of an everyman figure. Right. This is not about Jews and Portia uh, and to a lesser extent uh, Jessica are the woman of the world today, stuck with smart guys who end up not being as good as you would hope they'd be. So it's kind of democratic. It's very democratic. It's funny. It's sad. It rages. Uh, it covers a lot of emotions. And, uh, you know, a handful of Shakespeare plays give you that roller coaster experience. It's hard to control and it's hard to modulate. They pull back from having uh, Portia say one of the deadliest lines when a, when a black man tries to uh, marry her. The blow off line Shakespeare gives her, let all of his complexion, you know, woo me so, they cut that, you know, okay. you know <laughs> let's not go there. No, no. Uh, so they pull some punches, yeah, yeah. but they throw enough to, to make it an entertainment. And one thing we have to keep in mind, though, too, though, you know, Shakespeare wrote star vehicles, and Shylock, yeah. when he wrote Shylock, he was thinking, I'm writing for a star of my time. That's who, right. Who would have played Shylock originally? Well, Do we, know? we don't know who first played the role, but Burbage was the main man right. in Shakespeare's company. This play was performed twice before King James, a decade after it was first staged, either because James fell asleep sleep at the first production, or he loved it. We don't know which one it is. You can decide yourselves. But Shakespeare's theater was a star theater. And I, when I go to see, I love repertory theater, and I love seeing young actors grapple with these roles. But Shakespeare would not have been Shakespeare without Burbage, without Will Camp. Right. The rival companies had their own stars. Mm. And uh, people pack houses to see stars because stars are charismatic. And he's writing the part for a charismatic actor. Pacino feels that, and he 
and knows what it is to be charismatic. That's why all the great all the great Shakespearean actors have played Shylock. Even someone Absolutely. that you wouldn't think like John Gielgud supposedly gave a very interesting Shylock. Not yeah. a role I would necessarily associate it with Gielgud. You think of him more in the Hamlet mode. And it's not the guys who play the pretty boy faces. Yeah. You know, F. Murray is a character actor. Pacino is more than a character actor, obviously. Dustin Hoffman more. But they, they understand the sense of being uh, oppressed and abused. They, they've added a scene to, to, to a little spoiler here that's not in Shakespeare. The scene where Sherlock is, is, is actually dunked. Baptized. Yeah. And uh, baptized. A friend of mine was watching the play the other night and there were a row of religious Jews who didn't understand that he was being baptized because they'd never been to a scene of baptism, but <laughs> he is indeed baptized uh, in that in that moment, and uh, it's a harrowing moment uh, at that. You know, you know, for me, it's I'm not expecting it. it's not in the script, uh, but it, it it gives you a sense of the menacing quality of the Venice that uh, mm. uh, the mean streets uh, of Venice that he inhabits. It's still amazing though. What three hundred how many years? Four hundred years. Four hundred years later, the play still provokes. Has debate legs. and discussion. <laughs> it's a great play, and you realize when you go to see good plays, bad plays, revivals, yeah. uh, Angels in America, whatever. You know, I, I think Tony Kirchner is a great, great playwright, but these plays, and he'd be the first to acknowledge it, have areas which we're still unpacking and trying to understand. As the world changes a little bit, we see into them a little bit more. Fascinating. Jim Shapiro, uh, uh, thanks so much for your time. He's the professor of Shakespeare Studies at Columbia University. I am indeed. Uh, the book is Shakespeare and the Jews, uh, also Contested Will and 1599, A Year in Shakespeare's Life. Uh, do you have another book in the works? 1606. Uh, uh, what's year important about Lear, that year? Uh. Year of Lear and Macbeth. Oh, fascinating. It's going to take me another five years, but invite me back then, and okay. I'd love to talk about it. <laughs> we hope to see you before that, Jim. Thank you. Okay. I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same disease. Cured by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer. As a question is, if you prick us, do we not bleed? Huh? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in death. Look what I found. I know. The picture of the naked girl on the Appian Way. No. This is the other picture. The... Oh. The one we took when we got back. In emulation. You were so beautiful. I was. Only... It wasn't the Appian Way. No. It was the Catskills. <laughs>Jo Clayberg is a really fine actress, one of my favorites, really. And you can see her all over town these days. <laughs> <laughs> She's more ubiquitous than Andrew Lloyd Webber, I think, on Broadway right now. Uh, you are currently starring in Naked on the Appian Way at the Roundabout Theater Company, the American Airlines Theater. Yes. Naked just, woman on a, a the naked, Appian Way. A naked girl, just uh, to get it exactly <laughs> right. 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 Oh, a naked girl. It was not, not me. <laughs> All right. A naked girl on the Appian Way at the roundabout before you begin rehearsals for the revival of Neil Simon's Barefoot in the Park at yes. the Court Theater. Yes, yes, yes. Jill Clayberg, welcome back to New York Theater and Thank welcome you. to Theater Talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, now. Before um, uh, you've sort of plunged into Broadway, you did uh, the Exonerated off Broadway. I, know. I did. And you were doing some uh, plays regionally, but you had not really worked uh, uh, on the main stem, so to speak, for a number of years. What has brought you back to the theater? Well, I'd say very simply, my kids are grown up. Mm -hmm. You know, I really thought it was hard to do plays and raise a family. Just the hours, you know, I mean, dinner time and homework time and theater mm -hmm. didn't quite work for me. So <laughs> I did other things. And um, but I really love doing theater. I really, really. And did you always it. miss it though while you were away from it? While you were raising children? I'm not children? a missing kind of person. No. You know, I'm sort of like what I'm doing is just okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I I wasn't sitting pining for for being in in uh, plays. But uh, now, you know, 
you'd have a lot of trouble getting me to stop doing stop. it. <laughs> now, you're also married to an eminent playwright. I am married to David an eminent. David Is it hard to, to be married to a writer like that and then go, oh, darling, I'm off to the theater? No, 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 no. He's, no, no. He's, He's low he, maintenance that way? He, yeah. <laughs> he, he can cook his own turkey dogs at night or whatever. Uh, no, he, he uh, he, he he had nothing to do with it. It was really right. the children. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I really was raising three children. Uh, my nine-year-old stepson came and lived with us when he was, you know, at was nine. nine. Yeah, and he's not nine anymore. And um, then I had two of my own, and I just really liked being home. And I did a lot of TV movies and stuff, other stuff. But I just the huge commitment that a play takes, not just in terms of time, but imaginatively, mm -hmm. and just. You know, you really have to, that has to be your prime thing. You don't go, oh, well, oh, well, then I'm doing a play. It's not like that. It's just, it's totally Yeah, you focused. have to sort of pitch the whole day to doing that three hours, yes, don't you? Yes, you do. Yes, you Did do. Did you find sort of now getting back into the rhythm of it, having done uh, all those movies um, and the TV shows, which maybe the TV stuff is not as difficult as doing a play, do you find, though, you've got to sort of flex the muscles again and it takes a little while to, to, to get back into it? There are different muscles. I mean, the one obvious one is a vocal one. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, I feel like in the last few years, I guess the play that I did first about five years ago, I was like, oh my God, I don't know, I haven't done theater. But I just felt very comfortable. I, I, I really like being on stage. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I'd say there are different muscles and you relearn different things. And, but each play is also a world in and of itself, too, and you're learning different things each play you do, you know, that, that if so, I mean, this is a very, it, this is a farce, really. Yeah, naked, um, naked girl on the yeah. happy way. Being married to a prominent playwright, uh, does he go to see uh, this uh, play in previews, and uh, does he offer his own um, criticisms or suggestions or problems with the play to his, uh, his wife late at night? Well, yes, and he knows <laughs> Doug, and he always has a few notes, and they're always very, very intelligent, and usually, they're, uh, you know. And what's the protocol for uh, uh, one famous playwright giving notes on another famous playwright's play? <laughs> Gives well, it through, through his wife. She just goes and says, <laughs> no, no, Rich, no. my husband David Ray yeah. last night thought that <laughs> yeah. scene in the second part of the play right. just wasn't working. Well, he, he did have a few, you know, it's wonderful to have someone who has such a great sense of theater come and look at something mm -hmm. and give sensible helpful notes. David weighed in in his usual way, sort of <laughs> gent gently but firmly and with a couple of good ideas, as I'm sure did many people. Mm -hmm. um, Your husband is a, is a little bit press shy, though, because I've tried to interview him many times you? before. Yes, and he, he doesn't <laughs> give interviews, so you're the family spokesman. Yeah, you that's you right. No. Why is that? Why does he feel well, that he he's doesn't? he's just shy. Really? He's, he's just not, it's not, it, it's not something that he does easily or, I mean, he will, he has done a few interviews and he's actually very eloquent mm -hmm. but I think he's he's just shy we only have a couple minutes left but I want to mention that your daughter has now become an actress was yes. this was this something you thought Jesus is swell or or were you one of well, those who thought, oh, Ray, no, Ray. 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 did you raise her to become an actress I did not raise her to become <laughs> an actress and she was she was a, a, a ballet dancer she loved the ballet and you know no I would say that I sort of discouraged her, as I would any child going into the arts, I would say a healthy dose of discouragement is, is not a bad thing. Um, but then she so strongly wanted it and has really uh, proven herself quite beautifully. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven from a place beneath. I, I must ask you, uh, uh, you were famous in the 1970s for Unmarried Woman starting over. You became a kind of an icon of the woman who is supposed to lead um, the sort of typical, comfortable, upper middle class existence of the time, whose world is then turned upside down. She has mm. to kind of fend for herself. Did you that's realize? That's not starting over. Uh, but well, Unmarried Woman, I think, really oh, is. That's, that's one movie, yeah. yeah. Okay. But, but that, was a, that was a movie that really It was a of, successful movie. It was a very successful movie. And you sort of became that, that woman of that generation. Did you realize that was happening at the time? Did you see oh, yourself no. as the standard bearer for mm -hmm. the new woman of the 70s? No, I mean, I'm sure you've interviewed enough actors to know that you do a lot of work and then one piece gets very successful and then you're identified with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's just 
that's the way it was. That's the way it was. And you were, did you feel that you were cast as that role and that's how I they began did. to see you? The, the, yeah. The Jill Clayberg part. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Then did you try to move away from that in any way or? You know, I tried to take interesting parts uh, and sometimes they over, you know, they, they, they crossed over that uh, line. But no, I, I, I would rather not do that. Joe Clayberg, it's a pleasure having you on Theater Talk. Thank you. You know what I think you really need? Yes, and I don't want to hear it. Because you're afraid to hear the truth. It's not the truth I'm afraid to hear. It's the word you're going to use. Well, you're darn right I'm going to use that word. It's love. Oh, thank you. <laughs> a week ago, I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> then I checked into the Plaza Hotel for six wonderful days, and do you know what happened to me there? I promised myself I wouldn't ask. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>